Daniel Burstein and Arna de Kaiser, you've written a book called Big Dragon, China's Future, What It Means for Business, the Economy, and the Global Order. Why did you call the book Big Dragon? Well, the dragon is sort of the ultimate symbol of China, and it's one that uh, Chinese people uh, associate a lot of positive things with. Uh, and it's actually becoming a, an interesting symbol in American culture. Uh, there's a lot of interest in dragons and the uh, mythic power of them. And it uh, also follows up on all the discussion we've had in the last few years in America about the little dragons in Asia, the, the emerging economies of places like Singapore and Hong Kong and Malaysia and so on. And ultimately, of course, the, the big dragon is, is China, the big economic power of the 21st century. Uh, why is it the big dragon? Well, in part it's the big dragon because the challenges are so enormous. China has a population of over a billion people. It has, um, which is largely rural, and it has to drag those people and the whole country into the modern world. And the challenges are, are unparalleled in nation building when you think of the um, potential, for example, that if uh, everyone in China started to drive cars, the world would uh, not only not have enough oil, but drown in pollution. So part of the big is just, you know, China will be different, and it will be very big, and the big challenge that lies ahead. In your book, you talk about uh, two events in 1995. One is the Taiwanese president's visit uh, to his alma mater, Cornell. One of you tell us about that visit. How did that come about? Well, the... Uh uh, Taiwan officials have been angling for a long time to get what is seen in their culture as a kind of recognition from the United States uh, by allowing them to, to visit the United States, which is something that has been ruled out uh, going back over 25 years to U.S.-China agreements. Uh, so uh, Li Tung Wei, the Taiwan president, uh, came up with an interesting plan to, uh, to uh, make a visit to what was billed as his alma mater. Actually, he attended uh, graduate school at Cornell very briefly. Um, and it was right at the time uh, of the 1994 uh, congressional elections when there was a major paradigm shift in the uh, operations of the U.S. Congress and the thinking. And a lot of new people had come into the Congress, particularly uh, people on the right and uh, Republicans who had always been champions of the Taiwan cause. And so it was a really interesting time to try to push this button and see if he could uh, get an invitation and get into the United States. The initial position the Clinton administration took was that they would not allow him a visa on the grounds that uh, it would be a violation of long-time understandings with China. And China, of course, views all these things having to do with Taiwan and, and many other issues very ceremonially and very theatrically. Uh, taking the position that it, uh, the, the least setting foot on U.S. soil by a Taiwan official would be a, uh, a sign of U.S. recognition of Taiwan, which is uh, something the Chinese don't want. So uh, this took place in those political circumstances, and uh, lo and behold, the U.S. Congress uh, passed a resolution 397 to 1 uh, endorsing the visit. Uh, and taking the position that, look, you know, we're a democracy, we let anybody in. Uh, he's a responsible person, an elected official in another uh, land. He's coming to visit uh, his alma mater. Uh, wh why should we be in the position of, of uh, not granting him a visa simply because it will anger people in Beijing? It did anger people in Beijing enormously and set up a uh, period of about two years of uh, intense confrontation between the United States and China. Tell us a little bit about the history of Taiwan and Beijing. What is that all about? The um, Taiwan has been part of China, an island off the China coast, of course, um, since the beginning of geographic time. And in various stages of Chinese history, it's been um, occupied by the Japanese or the Portuguese or other powers. And in the 20th century, um, it became important because in the 1940s, after the war against Japan, the Chinese fought a civil war uh, between the communists, represented by Mao Zedong, and the nationalists, whom we supported, whose leader was Chiang Kai-shek. And in 1949, when it became very clear that the communists were going to win that civil war, Chiang Kai-shek took his troops and many of his followers 
and a number of art treasures and other things from the mainland and removed them to Taiwan where he set up a government imposed martial law and the United States continued then to back the Chiang Kai-shek government on the basis that it was the free government of China and back to claim that um, all of China is one China and Chiang Kai-shek proclaimed that he was still the president and it was an outlaw regime on the mainland. So that set the stage for um, 20 years of hostility between the U.S. and China when we tried to isolate China and um, get the rest of the world to isolate China and supporting the Jiang government on Taiwan and building that economy and building its place in the world. So that's the history of that, uh, that conflict. What is the Clinton administration's view on the Taiwanese situation and has it changed from the first administration to the second? The stated uh, view has not changed. Uh, at the time that uh, Nixon first opened uh, relations uh, with China in the early 70s, uh, the fa very famous Shanghai communique, which uh, Nixon and Kissinger were involved in negotiating, uh, set forth the principle of one China and set in motion a whole process that culminated in U.S. normalization of relations with Beijing, China, uh, in 1980. Uh, and uh, since that time, uh, U.S. policy, the stated U.S. policy has been very consistent, that we uh, recognize the government in Beijing as the government of China, that we uh, uh, seek a peaceful solution to the Taiwan-China problem, uh, and so forth. Uh, in the first years of the Clinton administration, uh, I, f I feel that the Clinton policy towards China was very misguided. Uh, of course, in the, in the election campaign, uh, President Clinton, uh, at, at that time Governor Clinton, had uh, uh, accused George Bush of uh, coddling the dictators in Beijing, which set up his administration on a note of confrontation with China, where he set out to uh, win certain battles over human rights and trade and other issues with the Chinese that uh, have proven uh, very difficult uh, to win. And, and for the first years of the administration, he was really putting uh, the f whole future of the U.S.-China relationship on the line in, a, in an effort to get the Chinese to make some concessions that they never made, basically. Uh, so uh, uh, with Taiwan, what, one of the things that people in this country don't understand very well is that Whatever the war of words is on this issue, and, and in 1995 we had uh, not only a war of words, we had the Chinese shooting uh, rockets and missiles at Taiwan in a military test and, and uh, President Clinton dispatching U.S. naval ships to the Straits of Taiwan. Um, the reality inside China is that Taiwan is on its way to becoming the largest investor in China. Uh, the cross straits business between China and Taiwan is huge. There are factories all over the south of China that are owned by Taiwanese investors and Taiwanese companies with 15,000 Chinese workers, 20,000 Chinese workers. The regional integration of the two economies is moving very rapidly and is a very, very powerful force. And that is going on even while everyone bickers and argues about uh, the future of Taiwan and uh, even while the United States and China had very intense, uh, angry, emotive uh, disputes over Taiwan. China took no retaliatory measures against the Taiwanese businesses in China. So uh, what we're really seeing is the process of regional integration and ultimately, we think, a, uh, a federal China many years from now that will be able to incorporate Taiwan somewhat in the way that uh, China has incorporated Hong Kong uh, recently. Can you separate the economics from the politics in terms of China and Sino-U.S. relations? No, they're, they're totally intertwined. Uh, the old uh, 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 Mao Zedong saying that political power grows from the barrel of a gun uh, could be updated in China uh, to, to uh, say that uh, political power grows from economic power and, and vice versa. Uh, but certainly in the Chinese view, uh, they are very much integrated. And I think in our view, uh, in this country, we tend to see them as separate. But in dealing with countries like China and different societies around the world, we are at least coming to see that in other parts of the world, they are highly and consciously 
integrated. Uh, and if we want to understand what's happening in China, we have to really think about political economy and, and the, uh, the inter interconnections and balance of the two uh, forces. I wanted to ask about another event in November 1995 that you write about in your book. When you both visited, you're going to have to help me with the pronunciation, Kwa Shi? Chao Shi. Sorry, okay. Um, a Pro proving that things can be deceptive. <laughs> a, a, a businessman in China. How did you arrange this meeting? This um, Chao Shi at the time was the head of the National People's Congress, which is China's. Um, shall we say, China's version of a, of a Congress, which is now getting more and more active in uh, passing legislation and, and modernizing the country from a political and rule of law point of view. Um, Chao Shi uh, was a longtime Chinese political leader as head of that. And because Dan and I have been traveling to China, writing about China, doing business in China, we have met many of the people who are close to some of these leaders. And in an earlier visit, Dan had a chance to meet Deng Xiaoping and on this visit, we, um, we knew some of the advisors close to him, and we asked uh, for this opportunity to meet and talk with this man about what he saw as the future of legislation in China. What did you learn from the meeting? Well, it was a very uh, surprising meeting, and, and we should uh, update the story to at least point out that Chao Xi, uh, who, who I like to describe as, as China's Newt Gingrich, uh, in that he was uh, the equivalent of the the Speaker of the House uh, uh, as, as President of the National People's Congress, Chairman of the National People's Congress, um, uh, is now retired from that position. And at the recent uh, meetings in uh, uh, March of this year in, in, uh, in Beijing, uh, he's in fact, for all intents and purposes, been removed from uh, most of his positions and from the fast track of, uh, of power in China. And the uh, National People's Congress is now being chaired by Li Peng, uh, and uh, uh, also as part of that whole process, uh, Zhu Rongji has emerged as the uh, prime minister. Uh, so there's been a whole leadership uh, transition and shakeup that has gone on since that time. But what was really interesting about that visit was that uh, Chao Xi is a very enigmatic character. Uh, very rarely meets Westerners. Very rarely talks to the media. Uh, even less often than most Chinese leaders, which is rare to begin with. Um, uh, and he uh, gave us a very, very elliptical, metaphorical talk in which the point, if you could read the Chinese tea leaves, seemed to be that he was very concerned about uh, too many people from Shanghai, uh, China's biggest city, uh, being in the administration and too much power being concentrated in the hands of what he seemed to be referring to as some sort of new Shanghai uh, uh, clique or mafia. And of course this has very uh, resonant uh, undertones in China because during the 19, late 1960s, 1970s, uh, the so-called Gang of Four, which was led by uh, Chang Ching, uh, Mao Zedong's wife, arose and these four individuals in the Chinese leadership at that time were, were known as the Shanghai Gang or the Gang of Four and uh, were incredibly destructive and, and negative uh, forces on uh, Chinese political life at that time. So to insinuate or to suggest that there might be some new Shanghai Gang arising is a very uh, uh, challenging, uh, provocative statement to make. Uh, now, what the reality is, is that uh, Jiang Zemin, the uh, current president, uh, is from Shanghai and is a former mayor of Shanghai. And uh, Zhu Rongji, who has now become the uh, uh, prime minister, uh, also hails from Shanghai. But ironically, so does Chao Xi himself. Uh, so uh, this was all a, uh, a very metaphorical talk that could be read many ways, but what we uh, sensed at that time, uh, and it was a, sort of a first uh, peek under the uh, curtain of a debate that was taking place, uh, was that clearly Chao Xi had some different views and orientation than the, uh, than the Jiang Zemin group, and it has now become clear that Jiang Zemin has uh, consolidated his grasp on, uh, on power, and uh, Chao Xi has been very politely and quietly uh, removed from the leadership scene. Uh, whether this debate is purely a uh, 
sort of a power-based rivalry, whether it really has anything to do substantively with democracy and rule of law, which were issues that were uh, at least rhetorically very important to Chaucer. Uh, that is very hard to say, but uh, clearly uh, he has been a, a loser in the power struggle. I think he probably sensed or knew that at the time when we were meeting with him and the, his comments to us were kind of uh, uh, sort of last words on the subject, if you will. Uh, and, and I think he wanted that view to, to be known, uh, that at least he had a, uh, some substantial disagreement with the uh, current leadership group. How important is it for Americans to understand the internal politics of China? How do we read the tea leaves, as you said? Well, uh, uh, one, one quick thought would be uh, we, we can't. <laughs> uh, that is, it's important to try, uh, but to presume that we will understand or we will know, uh, as in the, the, the story I've just told you, uh, we can look back on it even three years later and still wonder if we understood it properly, if uh, we really knew what was happening there, if we really knew what the, what the subtext underneath the words that were said. Uh, I think it's very important to pay attention to that and to understand how different Chinese politics are than American politics, and, and in parentheses, it's also very important for the Chinese to understand American politics. Uh, they, for example, have a lot of trouble with the idea that the uh, president's word isn't law, and that there's this thing in the United States called the Congress that uh, is frequently at odds with the president, and that's, that's very hard for them to, uh, to uh, believe. Uh, so they tend to see any uh, congressional objection to presidential policies as some kind of grand conspiracy. Uh, but this is an important issue on, on both sides, I, I think, to, uh, to try to understand each other's political system and to understand that it's, it's fundamentally different from each other. There are some terms that Americans are familiar with, one of which is MFN. Uh, tell us what MFN is. MFN stands for Most Favored Nation, and it is a system by where um, certain countries of the world are allowed, most countries of the world in this case, are allowed um, a low tariff structure, making it easy to do trade, and where for other nations who have a lack of Most Favored Nation status, um, there are greater trade barriers and more restrictions. And China, it, this has been a bone of contention in U.S.-China relations now for many years, and used um, by interest groups and members of Congress who are opposed to um, a more normal evolution of U.S.-China relationships and of the U.S.-China relationship and, and of further trade. Um, it's been used as a weapon in, in an almost ideological sense to remind the Chinese of our displeasure over such things as uh, human rights and, um, and other such issues. I think it's important on MFN, and the debate will be back with us. It comes every year at this season, uh, and we'll be going through this, uh, uh, what I would call a political theater, again, because uh, I think the conclusion is foregone, uh, that is, MFN will be renewed and extended to China again this year, but uh, as Arna suggests, uh, the opponents uh, who are really not particularly opponents of MFN. They are opponents of the Clinton administration. They are opponents of uh, Chinese policies. Will use the MFN debate to air uh, all of their concerns about China. Uh, it, it's first of all important to understand this term is really a misnomer. Most favored nation sounds like we're giving some very high distinction uh, to China or or another country that is uh, granted MFN. In fact. There are about 170 countries that have MFN status with the United States. Uh, it is uh, MFN equals normal trading uh, uh, practices between the United States and other countries. Uh, what would be abnormal would be not to have MFN uh, with uh, a major trading power. In fact, there is no other major trading power uh, besides China for whom it is even a question. Uh, so that leads to the issue of why is it a question about China? And of course that dates back to uh, Tiananmen Square and uh, American concerns about uh, what happened there and seeking ways to punish China or to exert leverage over China. Um, if you really look at uh, trade policy, I think 
American trade and investment with China is one of the most powerful factors and forces for changing China in a positive direction. Uh, American investment in China creates good quality jobs in China, environmentally sound businesses in China, uh, worker rights in China, uh, American management know-how. Uh, it's very contributed, contributory to raising the standard of living and uh, improving uh, the atmosphere in China so that uh, democracy and, and political reform can proceed. Trade is, is very important. Everyone who wants democracy in China will tell you the Chinese dissidents themselves, the people in Hong Kong who want to see uh, a democratic China, the Christians who want to see a, a opportunity for religious freedom in China, everybody will tell you China has to succeed economically in order to have the political space to reform and to not feel threatened by the uh, search for, for democracy and freedom. Uh, trade is key to their economic success. So those in this country who would try to turn off trade in order to uh, pressure China into democratizing or pressure China into following our policy prescriptions are probably doing exactly the wrong thing to achieve uh, those goals. So since we're about to go through this drama, again, it's, it's worth uh, calling that to our uh, attention. Tell us about the human rights debates that come up in Congress about China. Well, this is a very uh, uh, important question because uh, Americans have very strong uh, personal and moral and political beliefs about the freedoms that we hold dear. And there is a strong sense in this country that these are uh, universal uh, freedoms, universal goals, universal aspirations of all peoples. And uh, we feel very comfortable exporting that view. Uh, and clearly in China, people do not have American-style personal liberty and freedom. And uh, uh, no matter what uh, any Chinese official might tell you, uh, China is not a democracy. It is a highly authoritarian uh, government. Uh, in which the democracy that has been achieved in recent years really is in the realm of economic democracy in terms of great strides in people's living standards and some very low-level political democracy. They're holding free elections in villages, for example, now, but certainly not uh, at the senior uh, government positions. So uh, there has been some progress in China, but but clearly not toward uh, a sort of Bill of Rights type uh, government. Now, uh, I tend to think that China has made uh, enormous strides, and, and, and we have said that in, in, in the book that this is the best time to be an ordinary Chinese person in 5,000 years of Chinese history. Why? Uh, because China is, is progressing because the economy is improving, because people's livelihood for the average person is, is uh, above subsistence level, uh, which it has, the average person in China has, has never had the kind of uh, economic wherewithal that the average person has today. And there have been great uh, freedoms of lifestyle granted. People can live where they want, they can work with the, where they want, they can begin to buy their own homes now, they can have their own cars. Uh, they can do all these things that are sort of private sector undertakings. The, the whole economy has shifted from being almost 100% state controlled to about half state controlled and half uh, what they term their private sector. So uh, this has been an enormous change. And there, are, if you're an artist in China, you can do most kind of artworks you like. Uh, as long as they don't specifically attack the government, uh, you're relatively free to engage in, to, if you're a writer, you can publish what you want. Our book is, is being published in Chinese, which surprises many people because it's a very free-thinking book about China and it is being officially published in China. So uh, there, there's been this tremendous progress. Now the question becomes, in that context, uh, what should American attitude be? Because remember, when we opened up this modern new relationship with China 25 years ago at the, in the time of the Nixon administration, uh, then that was the time that China was this 
uh, loathsome dictatorship. That was the time that millions of people were in political prisons and concentration camps. That was the time of total ideological control, uh, almost to the point of, of brainwashing. Uh, China has come so far in 25 years into the light uh, and towards a modern economy, towards a modern society, towards the beginnings of a civil political debate. Uh, there are, we were speaking about Chaoshur before, there, there are no more purges where people get killed and, and jailed uh, in the political leadership. These things take place rather quietly and, and uh, uh, more, more straightforwardly today. Uh, so, so given all this change, should we be harping on the Chinese to, uh, to uh, accusing them of being the equivalents of Saddam Hussein, uh, as some of our congressmen do? Uh, should we be arguing that they're among the worst violators of human rights in the world? I think not. I think they're moving in a much better direction, and we should support that movement. I wanted to ask about the format you used in your book. Something that uh, you run on almost every page is a margin quote, mm -hmm. if, if that's what you call it. The one here that I'm pointing to is actually written by Walter McDougall who is actually on Book Notes, a program we have where we interview authors. Tell us, who picked these quotes? How did you find them? Well, these, um, we call them sidebars. And they're there because um, we've always felt that no one look at China will ever suffice. So what we tried to do was to enrich the text, give people other points of view on subjects we were talking about, and just plain uh, put down some interesting facts that people might not have thought about. And um, both Dan and I have been involved in China for a long time, so these have kind of accumulated in our files. And when it came time to write the book, we thought this was a great way to, to integrate them and, and, and people could take the book and almost just read those sidebars and feel they, they've gotten to address a whole set of key issues about China in the future. How did you write the book? I noticed you both are from the same town in Connecticut. Did you sit in the same room and hound out each chapter? We did spend a lot of time together, uh, but uh, basically each of us wrote uh, different chapters and then each of us edited uh, the other's material. And uh, we wrote and edited uh, so many times that it uh, became fairly seamless in the end. It's hard to determine uh, who wrote what anymore. Also, tell us about uh, where you work. Uh, what's the Blackstone Group? Uh, the Blackstone Group is an investment bank in New York. And uh, we're involved in uh, mergers and acquisitions and private equity and real estate investing and uh, a number of other business areas. And um, uh, it's a very successful Wall Street sort of firm. We have a number of, uh, of uh, terrific people at the firm who are uh, uh, involved in public policy and, and uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, important public policy issues, people who've had backgrounds in government and so forth. So we're uh, somewhat different than other Wall Street firms in that uh, some people confuse us with being a think tank, um, but actually it's a uh, very much a private sector investment bank. How often do you go to China? Uh, frequently. Uh, we did most of this research uh, on the fly on, on, on multiple visits uh, back and forth. Uh, we've each been involved in the uh, U.S. relationship with China and in business with China for uh, about 25 years uh, or, or longer, um, and and uh, countless trips over that period of time. This book itself was the product of about four years of uh, research and, and back and forth, uh, uh, watching uh, a very interesting part of the roller coaster. I mean, the whole 25 years that we've been involved with China has been an enormous roller coaster in terms of American perceptions and and uh, U.S.-China trade patterns and and uh, the political events in China, which have been among the most uh, salient events of the late 20th century. Uh, but in particular, the last four years has been a, an intense roller coaster ride. And, and uh, in further answer to your question about writing the book itself, uh, I think we probably wrote about three times as much as is actually in that book, uh, because a lot of it had to be uh, cast aside as, as events changed. And Mr. Arnold de Kaiser, tell us about you and your background? Well, like Dan, I've been involved in China since the early 1970s, and I had the good fortune um, in the wake of that historic Nixon visit 
to be involved in some of the first cultural exchanges with China and the first business um, groups that went to China. And then in the late 70s, I opened up my own consulting firm in the China trade and over the years have helped um, a wide range of American companies do business there. And I've written several other books uh, having to do directly with uh, doing business in China. And um, like Dan, for the last four years, I've been very actively involved in, in researching, writing, and working on this book. Tell us which one of you picked the jacket. The publisher picked <laughs> the jacket. <laughs> Who is the publisher? Simon & Schuster. Great. Well, we thank you both for coming in to talk about your new book, Big Dragon, China's Future, What It Means for Business, the Economy, and the Global Order. Thank, thank you. you.